This is a short video on how to solder a resistor into a printed circuit board and what to look for in a good solder joint. Before you start you will need something to hold the circuit board. These are normally called helping hands. You also need your 25 to 35 watt soldering iron. Go no more than 40 watts. If your soldering iron has a temperature control and you're the first time person soldering, you might want to set it to 600 degrees. Your soldering iron tip should be well tinned and can be either a fine pencil point or chisel tip. Make sure you're using a quality rosin core solder and, and not an acid core solder. Acid core solder is used in the plumbing industry and I would recommend that you use a solder that has a diameter of either 0.8 millimeters or 0.032 inches. You'll also need a damp sponge or stainless steel scouring pad to keep your soldering iron tip clean. Clean the circuit board once you're done soldering. We will use rubbing alcohol and a toothbrush. Make sure the rubbing alcohol is at least 90% pure or better. This is the practice soldering board that I will use for this demonstration. It is a double sided printed circuit board which means we have component tracks on both the component side and the solder side. This view shows the component side. Flipping the board over, this is the view of the solder side. This is the side we will do all our soldering on. I'm now ready to solder the resistors onto my circuit board. I have my soldering iron set to 600 degrees Fahrenheit. I have my 6040 solder on the spool right here. This is my 6040 solder rosin core. I have a wet sponge right here and I have a stainless steel scouring pad right here. So to start off with we're going to look at the soldering iron tip. You can see here it's nice and clean. It's well tinned. So what we can do is give it a wipe off Give it a little wee bit of solder and give it a wipe again. So it's nice and clean. So the important point of, uh, that I'm making here is that you always have your soldering iron tip well tinned and clean because we don't want to be transferring any uh, contaminants to the circuit board. So what we'll do is we're going to install four of these quarter watt resistors and I'm going to install them into where a normally an 8 pin dip socket would go or an 8 pin IC would go on this practice soldering board. So normally what we would do is because this is just a practice soldering board and it, you know for home hobbyists what we can do is we're going to just bend the leads. We don't need to get too creative here. So that there at 90 degrees to the resistor body. Now we'll carefully insert them into the circuit board. I've installed the four resistors into the circuit board. Now the object of what we want to do here is try to get all the color codes the same direction. It doesn't much matter which way you start off, but it's nice to have them all pointing the same direction. So you can see here I've got the first two pointing one way and the next two pointing another way. Technically it won't make any difference, but I think I'm going to take two of them back out of the board and reverse them. The other thing that we want to do is we want to get the components centered between the holes and so that the components are laying flat down onto the circuit board. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull two of these resistors out and reverse them. Okay. 
Now I have all the resistors in the circuit board and all the color codes are oriented in the same direction. Any further parts that I put on like resistors that I will populate onto the circuit board I will match this orientation. Just for neatness. So that the parts don't fall back out the board I bend the leads approximately 45 degrees. If I find that there's still a certain amount of movement and that the component wants to lift up off the board a little wee bit, I can always use a little wee bit of masking tape to hold the parts in place. So I have the board now mounted firmly into my helping hand so it's not going to move around on me. So before I start soldering, I always wipe my iron nice and clean and then I will put the iron on the component lead and the pad. So let's just zoom in on that before I actually start to solder. And the important thing to remember is to have a clean iron tip. Wait a second and then thousand one thousand two. You're going to make your strike and, retire, and retract just like a viper. Here let's do a couple more here. Wait a second. Bring your solder in. There we go. You can see that it goes fairly quickly. I try not to get solder on everything. And that one's not that good. So we're just going to touch it up a little wee bit. There we go. So all the solder joints should look like little volcanoes. Now the brown stuff that you see on the circuit board is the flux that came from the solder. The solder joint should look like small volcanoes and not look like dog poop on the sidewalk. It's not a good idea to keep on feeding solder like here I'll do that right here and keep on feeding it. I put quite a bit in here and then I end up joining a couple things here and the solder is not you're going to see where the solder is going I put a lot of solder on those two joints I'm start. you can see here that the board is starting to get quite brown which is not good I'll show you where the solder all went remember those two pads that I kept feeding the solder into well it showed up on the other side of the board and you can see I got quite a gob of solder up in here so more is not always better you can see here it's and there now these here are looking pretty good some of these have a little wee bit of solder coming through which is quite normal now the reason that the solder flowed through the board so easily is that we have a plate through hole which means that the two pads the pad on the component side and the pad on the solder side are connected like with a little wee tube and the solder flowed through this metal tube and down to the other side gravity wins on this affair now this wouldn't have happened on a single sided board to repair this gob of solder or the excess of solder I'll just use my solder sucker to get it up off the board there we go because it's all over the place we're gonna have quite a bit here to remove there we go So everything's fixable here. So that doesn't look too bad. Let's have a close-up look at that. 
Oops. Let's go back a little bit. There we go. You can see I've done the best I can with the solder sucker. If I want to tidy this up a little wee bit more, I'm going to use a solder wick. I just put my iron over the wick and just wait for the solder to transfer into the wick. There we go. Let's just there. So a little more of the solder has been taken out with with the solder wick. Let's see what the other side looks like now. I think before I do any work on this side, I should wash up some of the flux with some rubbing alcohol and my toothbrush. So if I keep working the board, all I'm going to be doing now is making a big mess of the board and getting more contaminants into the solder joint. So the rubbing alcohol, the 99 or better proof rubbing alcohol works quite effectively in removing the flux off the circuit board. You can see that it's done a pretty good job here. When you start using chemicals that have every letter in the alphabet and you have a hard time pronouncing the chemical name, that's got to be bad for you. So let's just stick with rubbing alcohol to clean up the board. I'm going to use a solder wick on this side of the board. So again, I'll put the solder wick in between the solder joint and my soldering iron. And once I get it hot enough, the solder should wick into the solder wick. There we go. So I've removed a large part of the solder from those two joints that I put way too much solder on. Now again, wipe my iron clean and we'll come in and we'll just add a little wee bit more. So wait, thousand one, thousand two. Wait, thousand one, thousand two. And those look pretty good. So now I'm ready to cut the wires off the circuit board and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut to the top of the solder mound with my small wire cutters. I don't want to cut into the solder mound itself. There we go. So there's what it should look like when we're all done. Here you can see that all of the resistors are all nice and flat onto the board and well centered. I do have a little wee bit too much solder from when I was showing you the what would happen when you put too much solder on a circuit board. I, I could still clean that up if I wanted to. There's the finished product. Now to finish up, and I'm not going to solder anymore, I'll wipe the board clean once again with my toothbrush and rubbing alcohol. What I like to do is I put a little wee bit of rubbing alcohol in the cap of the, from the bottle. So that, and I never dip the, the toothbrush into the bottle because then I'll contaminate the entire bottle of rubbing alcohol. So I'll do this side and let's flip it over and do the other side quick. Oh, let's give this side a little bit of a bath. So, and we are now all done. So we'll just let the 
or dry, air dry, and we'll wait for the alcohol to evaporate. Now if you're working on a working project, before you power it up, make sure that the alcohol is totally evaporated because you don't want to cause any additional problems on the circuit board. This is a close-up view of the soldering on the component side. All the solder joints should look the same. Keep in mind I did not do any soldering on the component side of the circuit board. I did all my soldering on the other side of the circuit board and the solder flowed through to this side via the plate through holes. When you're soldering, try to make sure that you cover the entire pad and component lead. The final solder joint should look like a small volcano. It will take a fair bit of practice to get it right. If you don't get it right, you can always fix it, desolder, and try again. Make sure you clean the circuit board with the rubbing alcohol in between attempts. Good luck and may the force be with you.